I'm very sorry, Dr. Shirley, that you've been kept waiting this morning. Uh, there are one or two things which I need to say to those who are watching uh, online, so I, if, if you just forgive me for one moment before uh, I ask you to take the, the oath. Uh, I am sorry, too, to those who are watching uh, from home uh, about the, uh, the delay there's been uh, this morning, most regrettable. Um, in any event, what I shall do uh, today is, is alert you to something which is a, a risk in the, the evidence we're going to hear. And the risk is that uh, Dr. Shirley uh, will mention uh, the name or, or counsel will mention the name of somebody who gave evidence under an anonymity order uh, earlier on uh, this year, or last year. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a restriction order. You will have been used to this uh, when witnesses gave evidence earlier. Uh, and the restriction order is to prevent any, the publication of anything at all in any way, whether uh, online or in writing or in photographic form or, or by talking about the details, which may lead to the identification of that particular person. We do take confidentiality very seriously indeed. I ought to remind those of you who are watching on Zoom, it's about a third, roughly, uh, of the daily uh, cohort who, who follow the inquiry uh, online, uh, that back in September, I made an order in any event uh, just restricting the disclosure of anything uh, that was heard uh, on Zoom because Zoom was not time delayed. As you know, if anything inadvertently is mentioned in this hearing room, uh, the live feed on YouTube uh, can be halted. It's a delayed feed. Uh, you get it about two or three minutes after uh, the witness has said whatever the witness uh, has said or the question has been asked. And that gives time for that to be edited out uh, so that you don't see or hear something you shouldn't. And it minimizes the risk uh, of information being passed uh, around. Zoom is immediate. And so it's just as if you are here in the hearing room. And just as in the hearing room, uh, when those of you who are listening online have been here, you may hear things which should not have been said, inadvertently were referred to, uh, which uh, you won't have repeated to anyone because you understood very well that there was a restriction order uh, over it. But the same applies, of course, when you're watching on Zoom. It feels remote, possibly. But the principle is just the same. So back in September, uh, when we began uh, our hearings using uh, the Zoom platform as well as YouTube, uh, I made this order. And I just remind you of it because it applies to all our online hearings. And I'm afraid, for the reasons I gave you uh, uh, earlier, we're going to have ra rather more of those than we had ever planned for. And what I ordered then, and just let me remind you of it, uh, was this. Unless express permission is given by me or by the solicitor to the inquiry acting on my behalf, evidence given to the inquiry in oral hearings and broadcast by live feed accessible on the Zoom platform must be kept confidential and must not be disclosed or published in any form unless and until such evidence is broadcast on the time-delayed YouTube platform and or a transcript published on the inquiry's website. Any information that is redacted from the time-delayed feed and or the transcript of proceedings 
must not be repeated, disclosed, or duplicated to any third party. Now that order remains in force for the duration of the inquiry and at all times thereafter, unless otherwise ordered. I may, of course, vary or revoke it by making a further order during the course of the inquiry. And just so there's no doubt about it, so far as today's proceedings are concerned and the risk to which I referred earlier, uh, there is a specific restriction order which I now make. It's additional. In one sense, it doesn't add uh, anything to what you've just heard, but let me repeat it anyway. And it relates to witness 1303, W1303. That witness gave oral evidence at a hearing on the 11th of October 2019 and was granted anonymity. And I made an anonymity order during the oral evidence of Dr. Shirley, that witness will be referred to as Mrs. A. J. I make this order. The name and address of witness 1303, the name of her late husband, and the name of any other member of the witness's family, and any other identifying information, such as the witness's image or a description of their appearance, cannot be disclosed or published in any form unless express permission is given by me or by the solicitor to the inquiry acting on my behalf. Witness 1303 must be referred to only as Mrs. A. J. This order remains in force for the duration of the inquiry and at all times thereafter, unless otherwise ordered. And I may vary or revoke the order by making a further order during the course of the inquiry. Uh, that's taken me a little time, even further time uh, out of this morning, so I'm sorry once again, Dr. Shirley. Let me just um, check that my details are, are correct as to where you are. You're at home, I think. Uh, are you? That's correct, yes. And you're on your own, are you? Yes, apart from um, Luke. Yes. Who's um, the IT specialist. Uh, he's, he's our inquiry member of staff, and I think he's outside, is he, at, at the moment? Yes. Uh, so let me tell you, let me describe for your benefit what you're, uh, in a sense, looking at. You'll think you're looking at me at the moment. Um, I sit in a room uh, which is designed for about 200 people. At the moment, it contains a total of eight. Uh, and uh, they're all, we're all socially distanced. You will have seen that I'm still wearing a mask, hence my rather odd appearance when it's to make it easier to talk. Um, Miss Richards will be the only person during the course of the proceedings, uh, except on occasions for me, who's without a mask, uh, and we are sitting well apart from each other. Uh, but you're not talking just to us. Uh, you're talking to a, a much wider group of people. There'll be somewhere between 100 and 200 probably, judging by the attendances earlier this week. Um, and let me describe to you where they are. They are at home or, or elsewhere, following remotely, either on Zoom or YouTube. Uh, and uh, you're talking, therefore, to them as well as to us. I've described the scene. Let me hand matters over now to Miss Richards. I think first Dr Shirley will need to be sworn in by Mary. Yes. Please state your full name. Janet Ann Shirley. And repeat after me. I do solemnly, sincerely. I do solemnly, sincerely. And truly declare and affirm. And truly declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. 
that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, shall be the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and nothing but the truth. Dr. Shirley, can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. Good. I'm going to start by um, uh, asking you a little about your career. You qualified as a doctor at the Royal Free Hospital in 1971, is that right? That's correct. Um, and you worked uh, for a period uh, in a junior capacity on the liver unit under Dame Sheila Sherlock. Yes. You held various general medical posts, and then in 1974 you began uh, various haematology posts at the Kingston Hospital. Is, is that correct? Yes, the, the first post was not specifically a haematology post. It was a general pathology post, and I spent six months in each of the four pathology disciplines. And, and you were at the Kingston um, uh, rotating around the haematology disciplines between 1974 and 1978, first as a registrar and then as a senior registrar. That's correct. Then from 1978 to 1980, you were a senior registrar at St. Thomas's Hospital. Yes. Um, and uh, your rotations there included the Haemophilia Centre. Was this your first experience of working with patients with bleeding disorders? Yes, it was. Apart from some experience of patients with low platelet counts when I was at Kingston Hospital. So I may ask you a little more about St. Thomas's um, a, a, a while later. Um, you also, during that 1978 to 1980 period, uh, had a, a placement for a short period of time at the Blood Transfusion Centre in Tooting, I think. Yes, I did. And what did that entail? I don't actually remember very much about it. Um, it, was, it was a shorter time than it should have been, as far as I can remember, because there were problems with um, finding places for senior registrars in blood transfusion, uh, um, the blood transfusion centres. Um, I would have spent time looking at how um, the orders for blood products came in and how they were issued to different hospitals. And also um, I would have spent, um, I spent some time at the donor centre seeing how um, don donors were managed. Um, that's really all I can remember about it, I'm afraid. And in what year had you taken your MRC PATH exam? In 1979. Uh, you then, in February 1980, were appointed as a consultant haematologist at Frimley Park Hospital, and you remained yes. in that post until May of 1997. That's correct. Um, now, you've explained uh, in your witness statement that you, uh, in that capacity, were responsible for providing a clinical and laboratory haematology service to the population served by that hospital. Uh, so you were dealing with a range of haematology services, is that correct? That is correct. But amongst other matters, uh, your statement tells us you developed an associate haemophilia centre there, and I'll, I'll come back to that in due course, but that, that's correct in outline. Yes. You also say in your statement that you set up and chaired the Hospital Transfusion Committee. When was that? Uh, when was it set up? I, I can't remember. Um, I think I set it up when I was Clinical Director for Pathology. So that would have been a number of years later. You were clinical yes. director for pathology for the last six years of your time at Frimley Park. Yes. Um, then 1997 to November 2000, you were medical director of and a consultant haematologist at the King Edward VII Hospital. Did you have any involvement during that time with the care of patients with bleeding disorders? Patients with bleeding disorders, yes, but not patients with haemophilia. Um, did you have any involvement with the care and treatment of patients with HIV or hepatitis during that period? No, I didn't. 
Uh, and then um, April 2001 to January 2011, you were consultant haematologist at the Royal Surrey County Hospital uh, and also for the first five years associate medical director. Um, to what extent did your role there involve the care of patients with haemophilia or other clotting disorders? Um, again, I, I dealt with patients with bleeding disorders, but not with haemophilia patients. So I dealt with patients with low platelet counts and patients with von Willebrand's disease and a few other patients with rarer clotting disorders. But because it wasn't a haemophilia centre, I didn't deal with haemophilia patients. Um, and then you retired, uh, did you, in 2011? Yes, I did. Um, now, coming back then to the Frimley Park Haemophilia Centre, um, you have said in your statement that you developed that as an associate haemophilia centre and it was designated as such uh, between 1980 and 1981. C can you assist us with how and why uh, a, an associate haemophilia centre came to be established at Frimley Park? Um, the reason why was because um, some patients with haemophilia were turning up at the hospital with a bleeding problem because their main centre was a long way away um, and it seemed a good idea from the patient's point of view to um, set up a facility at Frimley Park Hospital as an associate haemophilia centre. Um, I can't remember exactly when it was set up. Um, it wasn't there in 1980 when I arrived as a consultant, but it was there um, by 1981, because I was at one of the Haemophilia Centre Directors Organisation meetings. Um, and I would probably have discussed it with um, the Haemophilia Reference Centre at St Thomas's Hospital about how, how to go about setting it up and what was required, because that was where I had qualified. Was it your idea to develop the, the service as, a, as a, an associate centre there, or, or were you asked to do so by the hospital? No, it was my idea. It was part, when, when I went there, when I went to Frimley Park as a consultant haematologist, there were no um, clinical haematology facilities. Um, it had been purely a laboratory service um, with haematology advice given to um, patients with haematological disorders who were admitted under the general physicians. And my, I was asked by the hospital to set up a clinical haematology service, which I set about doing um, by um, setting up haematology outpatient clinics, um, gaining access to beds for haematology patients which would be under my care rather than the general physicians. And as part of that, also setting up the Associate Haemophilia Centre. Now, as, as you've told us, at some point between 1980 and the autumn of 1981, when you attended your first UKHCDO meeting, um, the, the service there had been designated as an Associate Centre. Mm. Can, can you recall anything about what the process was of designation? Who was it who who accorded you the title of, or from the park, the title of associate centre and allocated a centre number to, to the service? I, I honestly can't remember. Um, I, I'm sure somebody would have, would have come to make sure that the blood transfusion laboratory had the wherewithal to safely um, store cryoprecipitate and factor eight, and also to reconstitute it. And I would imagine that somebody would have had a discussion with me about um, how I was going to manage the centre. Um, obviously, somebody told us that we would need to set up the haemophilia patients register um, and um, we were already sending returns of blood products used to um, 
the National Blood Transfusion Service Centre at Tooting, but I really can't remember what the, what the process was. But it, it, is this right, that the patients that you saw at Frimley Park, generally at least, uh, um, under the auspices of the, the, the Haemophilia Centre, uh, would ordinarily be registered with another centre as well? They'd be registered with a reference centre or another main centre? That, that's correct. Um, we were really um, set up to be able to manage routine outpatient follow-up so that they didn't have to travel long distances and also um, to manage them if they had a, a, a bleeding problem. Uh, and you explained in your statement that the reference centres um, with whom uh, the, your, your patients were mostly registered would either have been Oxford the Royal Free or St Thomas's? Yes, and also boys at the Lord Mayor Trelaw College. Um, uh, the expectation you explain in your statement was that such a patient would once or twice a year attend their reference centre, but if they needed supplies for their home treatment or if they had a bleed, they might then present to Frimley Park on the basis that it was closer, it was their, their most local facility, is that right? That's correct. Um, and if we just look at your statement, uh, I'll ask for it to go up on screen as well, it's WITN 3901019. And if we could go to Shame it to page five. We can see in paragraph five a description um, of uh, uh, Frimley Park as an associate centre. Associate centres were small haemophilia centres which did not always have the medical and laboratory facilities for comprehensive full-time care, but which provided treatment for most of their local patients most of the time Patients attended for regular home treatment supplies or for treatment of minor bleeds, but were also under the care of a reference centre or other designated haemophilia centre for regular tests and treatment of any major problem. Associate haemophilia centres had suitable medical staff to give the treatment, correct storage facilities for the concentrate, and had to cooperate with the main centre in record keeping. Major haemorrhages and surgery were still managed at the main centre where full laboratory backup was available. Um, and then you go on to say, a few lines further down, patients were asked to attend the main centre once or twice a year for routine tests, such as coagulation factor levels, hepatitis, and the presence or, or absence uh, of inhibitors. Um, is, is that all correct? Yes, it is. Um, how was... Um, we can take that down, thanks, Janet. How did the relationship between the reference centre and you at Frimley Park generally work? Um, usually the reference centre would refer a patient who lived in the area um, of, my, of Frimley Park Hospital to say, would you take over this patient for day-to-day -day management? and would give me the details of the patient's diagnosis, the level of the clotting factors, what tests had been carried out, whether, for example, they were um, hepatitis B positive. Um, and then I would um, see them in my outpatient clinic, um, check on their general health, you know, um, whether they'd experienced any problems since their last visit. And I would then write to um, the director of their main centre um, telling what had happened at the outpatients. If I had carried out any blood tests, I would send those results. Um, and I would be relying on the main centre to see them at least once a year um, in order to um, direct me if there were any changes in patient management. Uh, you said also in your statement, if you were concerned about a patient, you could contact the reference centre by phone to ask for advice. 
That's correct. Although you had the reference centre to contact in the way you've described, would you agree nonetheless that as a matter of principle, clinicians in associate centres giving treatment would still need to keep up to date with developments relating to bleeding disorders and treatments for bleeding disorders? Um, we, we would need to keep up to date, um, but you need to understand that we had to keep up to date with an awful lot of other haematological diseases. Um, so our ability to be really up to date um, would not be as great as um, the clinicians at the main centres. We'll, we'll, come, we'll perhaps come back to that in, in, in a little more detail um, later. Um, you, you've again set out in your statement um, what your role was as consultant haematologist and director of the Associate Centre, and I just want to ask you a little more about some of the responsibilities you've described. So um, you had to keep a register of patients seen at the centre. How was that register kept? Um, we had a, a book in the blood transfusion department, um, so we would have the names of the patients, their diagnosis, their factor level, and then we would, and whether they were hepatitis B positive, and obviously later on whether they were hepatitis C positive or HIV positive, um, and what blood products had been issued and used for them. Um, and was that register shared with any other organisation at the Reference Centre or the um, uh, Oxford uh, for the purposes of, of its database? And not as far as I recollect. Um, then the second responsibility you describe in your statement is, is prescribing and supervising the use of blood products to haemophilia patients and patients with other bleeding disorders. And that would involve you taking a decision in relation to an individual patient, having regard potentially to what the reference centre had told you about that patient, but you taking a decision as to what products to use on, on any given occasion when you were prescribing treatment. That's correct. Um, it, it was also part of your responsibility to submit annual returns to Oxford? Yes. Uh, and you explained also in your statement that it was part of your responsibility to review patients regularly in the outpatient department and ensure that they were reviewed on an at least annual basis at their main centre. Yes. Uh, if you had a newly diagnosed patient, you would refer them to the reference centre for registration and assessment. Was that a common occurrence? What well, common because of new patients or common that I referred them? Co common to have a patient who was newly diagnosed? Um, I suppose we had one or two patients a year. Um, obviously there were um, children that um, developed a bleeding problem and were diagnosed as potentially having a coagulation disorder. Um, and then there would sometimes be milder haemophiliacs who hadn't had a problem in the past, but who presented with a, a bleed after trauma or after surgery. And then there were women with um, um, history of bleeding after or during childbirth or with menorrhagia who um, w were diagnosed as von Willebrand's disease. Um, and so anybody who hadn't previously been diagnosed that I suspected had a bleeding disorder, I would refer to a reference centre for diagnosis. Uh, and then um, you also said in your statement that your responsibilities included attending meetings of haemophilia centre directors whenever possible to liaise with other centre directors and to keep abreast of developments. It, you didn't, I think, attend every annual UKHCDO meeting you attended in 1981 and, and, and again in, in the autumn of 1983 and then some later ones. Um, uh, uh, what, what, why was it that you didn't attend every single year? Um, well, 1982, I was pregnant, so I wouldn't have attended. Um, 
because I would have been on maternity leave. Um, I was a single-handed haematologist for the first five years I was at Frimley, so I had to manage all the haematological problems. And um, we didn't have pages or mobile telephones, so I couldn't be very far away from the hospital um, for a long period of time. Um, and also, because I had um, um, two small children at home, I didn't want to be away from home overnight um, because um, I had to look after the children. And so I only attended those meetings that I could get there and back in a day. How then more broadly did you keep abreast of, of developments? Um, I mean, I, I, I relied on, um, obviously, the, the meetings, um, the minutes of the meetings, um, um, discussions with haemophilia centre directors about um, issues regarding patients. Um, I regularly took the BMJ and the... Um, the Hematology, British Journal of Hematology. Uh, we had one copy of each in the laboratory, and I used to um, have a look at that whenever I had time. Um, but to be honest, I didn't have an awful lot of time um, with with my job and my family. Were there any other haematologists at Frimley Park at the time with whom you could confer? Um, not until I appointed a second haematologist. There was a consultant at the Royal Surrey um, that I used to um, consult if I had um, problems with non-bleeding patients. If I had problems with bleeding patients, um, then I used to phone um, usually um, Dr. Savage at St. Thomas's Hospital, and then when Dr. Bevan went to St. Thomas's Hospital, I used to phone him on a regular basis. Um, on average, in the first part of the 1980s, so 1989 up to, up to around 1985, are you able to assist with how many bleeding disorder patients you would typically see in a year? I, I really, I really can't remember. Um, most of the patients I saw were mild or moderate haemophilia patients, um, and also I, I did have a cohort of boys um, who were um, at Lord Mayor Trelaw College, um, whom I saw on a regular basis. Um, it's very difficult to say, but probably not. I, I mean, I'm guessing here really, but probably about 20. If we look at the 1983 annual returns, and I think they're the only returns we have for the first half of the 80s. Um, if we go to HCDO four zeros, two zero eight underscore zero zero four, please show me. Um, so we can see these are an, annual returns for 1983. It's centre 123 was the centre's number. You're identified as the director. Um, this is total number of haemophilia A patients treated during the year. Four, total number of von Willebrand's disease patients treated during the year one. So um, we'll come on to the uh, haemophilia B in a moment. But it looks like in terms of actual treatment, you've got five patients with haemophilia A or von Willebrand's that year. Would there also be patients that you would see which wouldn't be reflected in the annual return because you weren't, in fact, providing them with treatment? Yes, that's correct. Um, and also, there might have been patients that I saw who were treated with um, DDABP later on, um, which weren't on the, I don't think they were on the haemophilia returns because I think it was 
the returns were only regarding patients who had been given um, factor concentrates. Or, or, or we can see cryoprecipitate. Um, uh, and if we just look at what was being used here, there's a small amount of cryoprecipitate used for a von Willebrand patient in hospital. Uh, and then we can see LHS factor eight concentrate being used in hospital, the number of units given there, 4,290. And then for home treatment, a larger number, 110,670 units. And then we can see armor factor eight uh, concentrate, a small amount used in hospital, 1,225 units, uh, and then 19,100 units used for home treatment. Um, I don't know whether you can answer this when we don't have the other returns, but does, does anything about this strike you as unusual or is, does this look pretty typical from, from as far as um, you can recall? This, this looks pretty typical. Um, I have since had some return, uh, returns for, I think, in the 1990s, and I think there were about six patients there. So it, it seems that this is fairly typical. Um, for the sake of completeness, the annual return for the same year, 1983, in terms of patients with antibodies recorded that you treated none. Um, and then we'll just look at the return for haemophilia B patients. So that's um, Shamik HCDO four zeros two zero eight underscore zero zero six. Uh, we, we didn't treat any inhibitor patients. They were always treated at their main centre. Okay. Um, and then this is haemophilia B for 1983, two patients treated during the year, uh, and the product used is LHS factor 9 concentrate for hospital treatment. wanted to ask you next about the arrangements for acquiring uh, cryoprecipitate and uh, factor concentrate. So if we can take that down, Shane, thank you. You have said in your statement that you had no input at all into decisions about the selection and purchase of blood products uh, and that um, both NHS and commercial products were obtained by Tooting Regional Transfusion Centre and then you obtained your supplies from Tooting. Is that correct? It is. And did the same apply in relation to cryoprecipitate? Did you obtain your supplies of that from Tooting, or did you, the hospital have its own in internal supplies? No, it came from Tooting. Do you know how Tooting decided <coughs> what products to keep in stock at the transfusion centre and then supply to you? No, I don't. Did, did you ever make any representations to Tooting about wanting to have different products or particular products that you can recall? I, I don't remember doing so. Now, you said also in your statement that you would then order products from the Tooting Regional Transfusion Centre. Can you just tell us how that worked? Whether it, was it on an individual patient basis or, or periodically? We did keep a supply of factor eight um, in the blood transfusion department so that if a bleeding, uh, sorry, and cryoprecipitate as well, so that if, if we had a bleeding patient, we had some on site, but we only kept a very small amount, enough for an initial dose. And then if um, a patient had an ongoing bleeding problem, we would order product from Tooting, um, saying the, the number of units that we required, and they would um, they would courier it down to us, so we could get supplies on a an emergency basis from Tooting that would be sent down immediately. And so, if you wanted cryoprecipitate, you would presumably simply say you wanted cryoprecipitate. Yes. If you wanted factor eight concentrates. Um, uh, did you uh, specify NHS or commercial or, or a particular type of commercial, or did you simply say we need some factor eight concentrates? We simply said we needed factor eight concentrates. So whether um, uh, a patient, an, an individual patient, received 
NHS concentrate manufactured by BPL or, or a Scottish concentrate manufactured in Edinburgh or a commercial concentrate, and if so, which one, was ultimately depend simply on whatever it was that tuting supplied to you? Yes. Did you ever have any discussions that you can recall uh, with Tooting about um, any shortages of NHS product and, and, and whether it would be possible to obtain more NHS product rather than having to rely upon commercial? I, I don't remember any such discussions. If you had a patient who was on home treatment, and as I understand it, the home treatment programmes were not set up by you but by the reference centre, is that right? That's right. So if you had a patient, say, from Oxford who was on home treatment and uh, um, who was ordinarily receiving NHS concentrate, and, and Dr. Richard would write to you saying this is what the patient receives, how would you be able to secure that that um, treatment continued with the same concentrate? We, we I, I don't remember anybody at Oxford being on home treatment. There were patients at St Thomas's, I remember, being on home treatment, and St Thomas's used to send down the supplies to us. So they obtained the treatment and then sent it. They either sent it to us and patients picked it up from the hospital blood bank, or they sent it direct to the patient's homes. Um, now, You've indicated most of your patients were, were mild or moderate. Um, uh, uh, on the occasions that you saw patients with a severe bleeding disorder, um, if, if this arose at all, what was your first line of treatment for them? I'm talking here about 1980 through to 1985. I don't remember a patient who was a severe haemophiliac coming in with a bleeding disorder uh, bleeding problem because as far as I can remember um, no sorry we would we would have had some um, um, I'm just trying to think most those with a severe bleeding disorder would have a program for treatment from their main centre. So um, we would ha we would have some information saying what number of units of what product were normally given for that patient if they had a bleed, and therefore we would endeavour to get what was um, written down as the program of treatment for them. So is, is this right? In the case of a severe treatment, you wouldn't usually be taking a decision yourself as to what treatment they required. You would be following the treatment mapped out by the reference centre. Yes, as far as I can remember. So, and dealing here with haemophilia A for current purposes, mm -hmm. those patients in respect of whom you were taking a decision mm -hmm. would ordinarily be mild or perhaps moderate at least um, haemophilia A patients. Yes. And you've said in your statement that cryoprecipitate was your product of choice in the first instance. Is that right? That's correct. Um, and then if that didn't lead to a sufficient level, factor level, you would you then um, turn to concentrates. Yes. What about DDAVP? When did you first start using DDAVP? I can't. I really can't remember. Um, I would have started using it as soon as it became a gen generally recognised treatment for boosting factor VIII levels in patients with von Willebrand's disease and mild haemophilia. But I can't remember when that was. Can you recall whether you'd had any experience of using DDAVP at St Thomas's? I don't. Was DDAVP something you also had to obtain from Tooting, or was that something that would be held in stock at Frimley Park? It would be held in the hospital pharmacy at Frimley Park. And then, in terms of patients who were 
previously untreated or minimally treated patients, was there any particular um, policy or approach that you had in relation to such patients who you were seeing for the first time? Um, as far as I can, can remember, I would treat them with cryoprecipitate. Obviously, if they were mild or moderate, um, once I started using DDAVP, I, I would use DDAVP first. What, what was your understanding um, in the first half of the 1980s of the relative risks of commercial concentrates uh, and NHS concentrates? My, my view was that NHS concentrates were safer um, to use because they came from volunteer donors as opposed to paid donors. And what was uh, that was that was res with respect really to begin with to hepatitis, um, and it was only um, in about eighty three eighty four that um, I had any knowledge of transmission of HIV through blood products. Uh, what about your understanding of the relative risks of cryoprecipitate versus concentrate? Cryoprecipitate had fewer risks of transmitting viruses um, because it was uh, that each pack was made from an individual donor, so you weren't exposing a patient to a large pool of donors. Now, if we come on specifically to the question of, of hepatitis, um, you worked in a, in a very junior capacity in 1971 under Dame Sheila Sherlock at the Liver Unit at the Royal Free. What, if anything, can you recall learning about hepatitis during that period? Um, there were patients whose chronic liver disease was a result of hepatitis B, um, and you could diagnose that because there were tests for hepatitis B. Um, there were other patients who had hepatitis, uh, chronic active hepatitis or cirrhosis, um, for which no causative agent could be identified. Some of those were thought to be um, autoimmune, and some of them were thought to be um, possibly due to a, a, a viral agent as yet unidentified. Do you recall knowing at, at that time, or, or indeed at any later stage in the 70s, about the various outbreaks of hepatitis that occurred at hospitals in which significant numbers of patients became ill and um, indeed some medical staff died. There was an outbreak in Edinburgh, there was an outbreak in Guy's Hospital and, and, and some elsewhere. Do you remember learning about those? No, I don't. Um, during the time you were at St Thomas's, you worked under Professor Ingram and Dr Savage, I think. Yes. What, what can you recall, if, if anything, that them teaching you about hepatitis, the risks of transmission, and, and, and the potential seriousness of hepatitis? I can't remember having any specific teaching about that. Um, my recollection of working with them was mainly uh, learning about the different types of bleeding disorders, um, and how to manage haemophilia patients if they presented with a bleeding problem. Um, did you, however, become aware um, during the period you were working at St Thomas's, if, if you weren't already aware of it, of, of um, what was by now referred to as non-A, non-B hepatitis? I don't remember... Um, learning about that until um, when I took up my um, consultant post. Um, but I might have, it's, it's such a long time ago, I, I really can't remember. Was it something that was studied as part of the MRC PATH qualification when you, when you took the exam in 1979? No, I don't remember us um, having to study anything about um, hepatitis. The, the inquiry has looked at and, and, and heard from clinicians about the significance of 
research carried out under Professor Preston in Sheffield, um, published in The Lancet in 1978, the liver biopsies undertaken and the results of those liver biopsies. Do, do you recall learning about that at all? No. You, you've said in your statement that um, you understood at, at, at a point in time that non-A, non-B hepatitis was more severe than hepatitis B. Where did that understanding come from and, and how did your understanding of non-A, non-B hepatitis develop? I think it probably mainly came from um, attendance at the haemophilia centre directors organisations meetings and, and the minutes from those. And I mean, I, I, I did attend haematology conferences and I could have picked up information there as well. Just, just dealing with hepatitis B for a moment, was, was hepatitis B testing of patients with uh, haemophilia or other bleeding disorders undertaken at Frimley Park or, or did you rely upon the reference centres for that? I usually relied upon the reference centres for that, but if there was no record of um, whether a patient had been tested for hepatitis B, then I would, I would arrange for a blood test. Um, and again, dealing specifically for present purposes with hepatitis B, would you tell the patient that you were testing them for hepatitis B? Yeah, I think I, I usually told my patients what I was taking blood samples for. And would you tell patients the results of the hepatitis B test? Yes, I would definitely tell them the results. But then re re returning to non-A, non-B hepatitis, um, do you think at the time you took up your post in 1980 that you at least knew that blood or blood products could transmit a form of hepatitis, non-A, non-B, or whatever one might want to call it, as well as hepatitis B? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I know I knew about it by 1984, um, but I don't know exactly when I gained that knowledge. W was it ever your understanding that non-A, non-B hepatitis was something mild or harmless or inconsequential? Or did you, whatever it was you understood that it existed, did you always understand it to have potentially severe consequences? Yes, I, I, I understood that it could cause chronic liver disease. Do you except that as a matter of principle, patients receiving a form of treatment which could infect them with a virus that could lead to chronic liver disease should be informed about that in advance so that they could decide for themselves if that was a risk they wanted to take. It, it, it's, it's very difficult looking back to the early 1980s when things um, were very different. Obviously, nowadays, one would tell patients that. Um, I do not, as I said, all my patients were registered at a main centre, which had the support of haemophilia nurses and other staff. And in my view, it was their responsibility to have those sorts of discussions with the patient that they were looking after. But before I ask you a little more about that, can I just go, go, go back to my earlier question? Whether it was the responsibility of the reference centre or your responsibility, did you, um, do you accept that even in the first half of the 1980s as opposed to the, 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 the 21st century, patients should have been given some information about the risks of their treatment, including the possibility of developing hepatitis? Yeah, I th yes, they should have done. Um, I think most, most haemophiliacs um, were aware of the problems associated with hepatitis. Severe haemophiliacs might have some understanding. It would perhaps depend upon what they were told, whether they were a member of the Haemophilia Society. M most of the patients you were seeing, you've told us, were mild or moderate haemophiliacs. What, what's the factual basis for your view that, 
that they would have an understanding of hepatitis if you never discussed that with them. I, I, I don't know whether they would have had knowledge of it or not. Um, I, I didn't... I don't remember discussing with a patient that my treatment might transmit hepatitis. A lot of the patients I had, even if they were mild or moderate haemophiliacs, were already hepatitis B positive when I saw them for the first time um, as a result of having received um, treatment for things like dental extractions in the past. You said in your statement, and, and you've told us a few moments ago, that it was your view that um, it was the responsibility of the patient's reference centre to have had discussions with the patient about about matters such as risks of, of, of hepatitis. Um, why was that your view? If, if you're the treating clinician, isn't it your responsibility to ensure that your patient is giving proper consent to the treatment and, and that involves them understanding the risks of that treatment? Um... A lot of the treatment, well, yeah, the, the treatment that I was giving was usually in an emergency situation. Um, it was often administered with, by a senior health officer. Um, a lot of this would have been out of hours and I would have been at home. Um, I didn't have the support of a haemophilia nurse or who would, as I understand it, at the main centres would have these sorts of discussions with patients before they had treatment. You see, Dr Shelley, the evidence, the inquiries heard from patients treated at, at, at bigger centres, at reference centres, much of it not all, but much of it has been to the effect that patients weren't given information about the risks of non-A, non-B hepatitis. Um, did you ever ask either the patient or the reference centre what information they provided to the patient so that you could know whether your assumption was correct or not? No, I didn't. Do you accept, at least with the benefit of hindsight, that the practice you're describing ran the risk that patients were receiving treatment in circumstances where the potential risks of that treatment had not been explained to them? Yeah, that's, that is um, eminently possible. Um, on the... On the other side of the coin um, if it was a severe bleed that could lead to disability or death um, one would want to go ahead and treat the patient it's still the patient's decision though it may well be that a patient facing very severe consequences of the kind you describe would choose to go ahead with the treatment but it's still as a matter of principle their decision as to whether to what risks to run? Would you accept that? It is their decision, and we would take that very seriously nowadays, but attitudes in the early 1980s were considerably different from the attitudes today. Um, medicine was a lot more paternalistic, and um, patients were not given the amount of information that they would be given nowadays. Do you recall whether there came a point in time in the course of the 1980s or, or the 1990s, whenever it was, where your approach changed and you did start explaining to patients the risks of um, non-A, non-B hepatitis? Um, by the time I was fully aware of the risks, um, heat-treated um, 
factor eight was becoming available. And where at all possible, I was putting patients into the 8Y trial so that I could make sure that they were getting heat-treated product. Does, does that mean that, that you, you didn't tell them of the risks because you um, thought that the product, the heat-treated 8Y product, wouldn't give rise to a risk of hepatitis? No, I, I would tell those patients that I was checking their liver function tests on a regular basis to find out whether the product was transmitting non-A, non-B hepatitis. And did you tell them, but by this time, so we're talking 1985, 1986. Yeah. Did, did, you, did you give them some information about what non-A, non-B hepatitis was and that it could lead to... Um, could potentially lead to, to chronic liver disease? I can't remember because I haven't had access to the trial protocol and what patient information was attached to that protocol. I, I would have um, followed the guidelines in the protocol. Um, do you accept as a matter of principle, I appreciate that you would, I'm asking you about events a long time ago, but do you accept that as a matter of principle, whatever the protocol said, and it, it, it may indeed have said precisely this, you, it, patients receiving the, those heat-treated products, 8Y, should be told about non-A, non-B hepatitis and what it, if it was transmitted to them, what it could entail? It, it's very difficult because, as I said, things were very different in the early... In, in the 1980s compared to how they are today. And um, peop people's attitudes were, were, were different. And we didn't tell patients nearly as much about the risks of treatment as we would nowadays. So yeah, now, nowadays I accept that as a matter of principle, that is the correct thing to do. But I can't say that in the 1980s, it would have been considered the correct thing to do as a matter of principle then. May I, may I ask a, a question? Um, uh, you, you've said that you, when you spoke to patients about their participation in the 8Y trial, um, you said you were taking liver function tests to see if uh, the 8Y gave them uh, non-A, non-B hepatitis. Did you, yes. uh, did you also tell them, did anyone say, look, wh why, are you, why are you giving me something that could give me hepatitis, uh, anything of that sort, or did you uh, head that off at the pass by saying that the treatment you've already been having carried that risk anyway? I, I can't remember... Um what sort of discussions I had with patients about the 8Y um, protocol at the time. I'm sorry, but I can't remember. So just, just for a moment, I, I pictured myself sitting there as you're consulting with me and saying, I, I want to take this test to see if what I'm giving you is giving you a disease. Uh, and I, the questions I, I think I, I might ask and might have always have felt inclined to ask, even in the 1980s, would be, well, what will that do to me if I get it? Or why are you giving me something that will give me a disease? Um, was there any, do you remember any, any conversation at all like that? I don't. Uh, but as a matter of principle, if patients ask me that sort of question, I would answer as frankly as I could and give them as much information as I had available. Uh, that wouldn't require uh, your going back to the protocol for the trial, would it? No, no. Thank you. So I'm going to move on to um, HIV and AIDS. Um, I know we started a little late, but bearing in mind people would have been online since 10, is this a convenient moment to break? Yes, we, we, we normally have a, a break um, shortly after 11 for half an hour. Uh, it allows you to take some refreshment and have a, have a break. So we'll do that and come back um, uh, at uh, 
10 to uh, 10 to 12. So 10 to 12, please, Dr. Shelley. Now, um, okay, thank the, you. the chances are you're not going to discuss it with anyone, certainly not with Luke, um, but you mustn't in any event discuss your evidence with uh, anyone at all, either the questions you've been asked or, or those you might be, uh, you think you might later be asked to give. Um, anything else you like, but not, not uh, your evidence. I'll see you okay. at uh, 10 to 12. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Sir Brian.